Welcome everyone to our Sunday worship for the third week in a row. My voice is still not up to full strength, but uh, we'll crack on anyway. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm perhaps simplifying things compared with uh, how I used to do things in the past. Still going to be a fair bit of talking from me. I thought to begin with a, a hymn read as a prayer it's Passion Sunday when we remember the suffering of our Lord Jesus leading up to his death. Let us pray. <clears throat> our holy Jesus, how hast thou offended that man to judge thee hath in hate pretended by foes derided, by thine own rejected, O most afflicted. Who was the guilty? Who brought this upon thee? Alas, my treason, Jesus, hath undone thee. T'was I, Lord Jesus, I it was denied thee. I crucified thee. Lo, the good shepherd for the sheep is offered. The slave hath sinned and the Son hath suffered for man's atonement, while he nothing heedeth, God intercedeth. For me, kind Jesus, was thy incarnation, thy mortal sorrow, and thy life's oblation, thy death of anguish, and thy bitter passion for my salvation. Therefore, kind Jesus, since I cannot pay thee, I do adore thee and will ever pray thee. Think on thy pity and thy love unswerving, not my deserving. Amen. And today's set gospel reading is from John chapter 12 and verses 1 to 8. Six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honour. Martha served, while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As a keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you but you will not always have me. Thanks be to God for his word. I think it's only human nature that when we discover someone has done a really bad thing, we tend to assume that actually we knew all along that they were a bad un. I never trusted him his eyes were too close together. He always had a shifty look about him. I always said he'd come to a bad end and so on. And I think there's something of that in John's record, record of uh, this incident. When John was writing, he knew that Judas had betrayed Jesus, which was indeed a very bad thing. Um, I think sometimes we 
we try and excuse Judas even by thinking of his motives. But whatever his motives, it was an appalling thing that he did. And yet, uh, and, and I don't want to minimise that, um, it, it was a real betrayal. And the thing about betrayal, though, is that it's not the same as like an undercover spy who was a baddie all along and then only at the end revealed their true colours. A betrayal is when someone who has been a genuine friend, a genuine supporter, turns against you. This is what happened with Judas. It, it wasn't that um, it, he was obviously a bad one all along. When at the Last Supper, Jesus was talking about uh, the betrayal that was about to happen. One of you is going to betray me. The disciples didn't say, oh, he's clearly Judas. He's the one whose eyes are too close together. He's the one who's got, always had this shifty look about him. We don't trust him really. No, they hadn't a clue which of them. Judas was one of the 12 followers chosen by Jesus, gone out on missions uh, with the other disciples and so on. But then at the end did something really bad in betraying Jesus. But I think John's sort of giving him even worse motives, knowing that this happened. John says, well, in this incident, he doesn't say that he cares about the poor because he really cares. He's a thief. He wants to look after the money. He's thinking about more profit for himself. And I think that's unfortunate because what Judas says, I think, is a perfectly valid objection. And in fact, I suspect it may be even what we would be thinking ourselves. A year's wages spent on a perfume that is just spent in a moment, uh, lavished on Jesus, just splashed over his feet. And yes, all right, it made the house smell good. Uh, it was a, a grand gesture. But, but all that money spent on that one gesture, was it really worth it when so much else could have been done if it had been sold and given to the poor? It's a, a similar situation to, I don't know, a church member who has um, a, uh, a, a ticket for a, a long weekend at a luxury spa hotel, five-star hotel, with all the, uh, the lavish treatment and beauty treatment, and they say, um, I'm going to give this to my minister because she deserves a rest. She works hard and it would really uh, cheer her up having a, a nice indulgent weekend. And yet it could have been worth thousands of pounds and could have been used in a raffle to raise money for the local food bank or whatever. It's that kind of thing, but perhaps even more extreme because I say, I, I can't even imagine a, a weekend at a luxury hotel being quite a year's wages, which this perfume was. But I think Judas has a valid point that needs to be addressed. And Jesus does actually address it. And we'll come to Jesus's response in a moment. But let me just pick apart the, um, the, the objection that Judas has, or at least that he voices. And what I want to do is look at the difference between our head and our heart. Head, heart. What's the difference? Thought and logic, emotion and feeling. Another way of describing that difference might be in uh, academic terms, uh, or at least school terms, between science and art. Science is about getting to the truth. It's about practicalities and logic. Whereas art is about beauty, feelings, appreciation, enjoyment and pleasure. And the two sometimes find themselves in um, opposition to each other. <clears throat> I'll give you two examples in one. One of my favourite um, albums of all time is Jeff Wayne's War of the Worlds. It's a, a double album in the days when, do you remember, they used to come in round 
uh, LPs instead of those little compact disc things or streaming or whatever you get these days. Uh, a double album uh, with artwork uh, based around H.G. Wells' story, The War of the Worlds. And one of the um, tracks on this album deals with the uh, later uh, meeting up of uh, the narrator played by Richard Burton in the, in the LP and uh, an artilleryman who is voiced by David Essex who also gets to sing his song. And it's at the point in the story where the Martians have taken over the earth and the humans are struggling to survive. And this artilleryman has a, a grand plan for, for rebuilding salvation by utilising all the underground tunnels and drains and sewers. And he imagines building a, a whole salvation underground. And as he gets enthusiastic, he talk, talks about uh, building hospitals and schools. And he says to the narrator, where men like you can teach them not poems and rubbish, science, so we can get everything working again. So just hold on to that thought for a moment. Not poems and rubbish, but science, so we can get everything working again. But later on, after he's had his song, uh, the narrator tells how uh, he cracks out the champagne. Nothing but the best when I'm the boss, says David Essex. And then he insists on playing cards. And the narrator can't quite believe this. There we were with our species on the edge of extinction and he actually insisted on playing a game. You've got two moments there in that uh, scenario where science and art are put in, in contrast. And in one, the artilleryman prefers science to art. Ironically, in the other one, and I don't think he realises he's doing this, he's prioritising art over science, in a way. The first one is he doesn't prioritise poetry. He obviously doesn't get on with poems. So poems and rubbish, we don't want those in the curriculum. We want science, where we can learn how to do stuff, all the practical stuff, all the the utilitarian stuff, the things that achieves things, gets things done, um, dismisses arts entirely. That's, that's not going to get us anywhere. Now, I would disagree with that because I think we need the arts to be human. We need appreciation, maybe not of poetry, that may not be your thing at all, but painting and music and theatre things that actually show us the beauty of this life, things that we can enjoy. Um, if you've been wondering about the background here, um, let me stand to one side just for a moment. There we have uh, Kandinsky, one of his abstract pieces. Um, so I don't know what you think about it. Is that art? I like it. I think there's something beautiful in this. But whatever turns you on, um, that's important in terms of being human, not just the practicalities of physics and chemistry and technology and getting things to work. But the, the other incident in that story I was recounting was when the artilleryman gets out a pack of cards and he insists on playing a game. Now I would put playing cards alongside other games and sports as part of the arts, part of the pleasure and the beauty of life. It's no practical use. I mean, what practical use is there in 11 men, no, sorry, 22 men kicking a, a football around a field, trying to get it into a couple of nets at either end? What use is that? What benefit does it have to helping to feed and clothe people? None at all. And yet it's called the beautiful game. People recognise there is beauty in that. Some people recognise there's beauty in that. Others would recognise the beauty more in, in this here or uh, in poetry or music or whatever. 
But even playing a card game, some people would think that was a, a beautiful thing to do. And, and giving enjoyment, challenging us, helping to use our uh, brains to, to try and defeat our opponent. Um, it doesn't achieve anything, but it's enjoyable and it's part of what life is about. And I think the artilleryman was in one sense quite right to put aside other issues and to say, let's just have a bit of fun because this is what being human is about. I think his mistake is that the narrator clearly wasn't in the mood for playing cards and games don't really work if uh, only one person's in the mood and other people are being forced into playing something that they're not interested in. So he got the timing right, wrong there. But while his species was on the edge of extinction, was that a time to be playing cards? And I would argue, yes, it could be. And one reason I can argue this is that um, although I'm not in the army myself and never have been, I, I, I pick up bits and pieces of what army life is like from the television. Um, and it doesn't surprise me that sometimes soldiers play cards. Men in the trenches during wartime will play cards as a way of entertaining themselves making themselves feel more human, celebrating something about life that is not just about the practicalities. And maybe cards isn't everyone's cup of tea. Maybe some uh, of the soldiers would rather get their book of poetry and go off into a corner and uh, read a bit of poetry. But the fact that they do it while in the middle of a, a war situation isn't to me surprising. And isn't a bad thing because ultimately life is more than just the practicalities. It's getting the timing right. There is a time and a place for these things. And if there's a group of soldiers in the trenches playing cards and the shout comes down, you know, the enemy are in the trenches. The, the soldiers don't at that point say, well, we'll finish our hand of cards and then we'll be with you in a moment. No. Suddenly at that point, the practical thing is, is the more important, dealing with the, uh, the issue in, at hand. But it is all about the time and a place for the right things. And this is what Jesus addresses. Jesus says to Judas, the poor you'll always have with you, but not me. This is the right time and place for Mary to be anointing my feet because there won't be another chance to do it. The, the situation in society would always be that there are poor people that need looking after, that need feeding, and that will involve money and practical support, the head, the science, the technology aspect. But right now, says Jesus, I, I value what this woman's doing, an act of devotion, an act which doesn't get us anywhere other than expressing her deep love, her devotion to me. And that's important. And in fact, it's important for Jesus precisely because there are some terrible things coming up. He knows he's on the way to the cross. He knows that coming up, there will be great suffering great pain. In a way, she is anointing him in advance of his burial, um, getting him ready to face all the hardship and the pain that he's about to go through. So Jesus knows these things are happening, they're on the horizon, but right now this woman's devotion to Jesus carries great weight and great meaning. Where does that leave us? in terms of um, uh, what we can learn from this. Well, three things really. One is to do with the situation in the world, and then there's the situation in the church, and then there's your own personal situation. In the world, well, at, at the time of recording, there are a couple of big things going on in the news. One is, um, the, the cost of living increase, 
which is hugely worrying to many people. Fuel prices going up, um, cost of living in all kinds of ways going up, and people who are already struggling, wondering how they can afford to continue living. These are practicalities that need to be faced up to. And the other big thing going on at the moment is the war in Ukraine. Now, without minimising either of those, it is true that even before the last few weeks, there were poor people struggling to make a living. There were wars in the world. There were refugees. There were people suffering. So the need for practical help and humanitarian aid hasn't just come into being. Something came up on the screen then and I don't know quite what it was. I shall trust that this is still recording and I shall press on. Um, these things aren't new. These are not things that have just uh, popped into existence in recent weeks but somehow they've intensified in recent weeks. It feels as if the world is in more crisis than it was a month or two back. And these problems are going to be with us for a while longer. And they need addressing. They need our brains. They need our practical help. They need us to think logically. What can we do to support and to, to change these things? But that doesn't mean there's no room for being human. Some people might look at the church and say, OK, well, in the midst of this crisis, what are we doing as a church? Is it right that we meet for fellowship and just have fun together? Is it right that we you know, sit down and chat over coffee after our services when there's poor people suffering and people are at war? and dying. Is it right that we spend our time in worship? What's that achieving? Should we be not putting all our attention into the practical stuff? And I think, no, I think there is a place, perhaps especially in times of crisis, for us as human beings and for the church to be doing human things to be enjoying one another's company, to be worshipping God. It's quite right and proper that we do this. The practicalities are still going to be needing to be dealt with at some point, and we, we don't necessarily put them off indefinitely, but we don't have to give our whole life and whole attention to those things. There is more to life than just getting things sorted and putting things in order. And as a church, and I'm speaking now partly from local experience, um, but I think this is what I'm going to say is probably true of the wider Methodist church and not just uh, our, our local uh, situation. We, we are a, a, a diminishing denomination. We are uh, an, an increasingly elderly congregation. People don't have the energy. They don't have the health that they once had, people are struggling to get the practical things done. There is a, a, a crisis within the church. We've got finances to look after. We've got properties to look after. We, we, we've got an organisation to keep going in some way. And it's not easy. And how are we going to deal with these things when so many people are, are, are struggling uh, in their daily lives and, and don't have the the skills or the time or the, the energy to do what once was done. And yet those problems are not going to go away. They'll still be with us tomorrow, the day after. We still need to set aside time for what we're really about as a church, which is worshipping God, listening to God, building up our relationship with Jesus, loving our Lord Jesus, appreciating all he's done for us, in suffering and dying for us. These are the things that are important. The Old Testament, right near the beginning, established a principle of a Sabbath, a day of rest, a day when work could be put aside and we can focus on God and on worshipping him. 
And I think that is right and proper for the church still today. The six days that we can work, but let's have at least one part of our week when we, we simply focus on worshipping God. The, the, the other issues still need, still need dealing with, we still need to pick them up, but let's not forget that, that being human and being followers of Christ means worship, it means love, it means devotion, it means pouring out ourselves as Mary poured out that perfume in, in praise and worship of God. And no, it doesn't achieve any practical purpose. We'll do that tomorrow with other things, but it, it's, it's part of what we're about as God's people. And then individually, I don't know your situation. Maybe you're not going through a time of crisis and that's great. But if you are, there will be practical things that you need to do. There, need to, there will, be, will be things you need to tackle. But don't put all your attention and focus all your thoughts on that. Leave room for the heart too. Leave room for love and relationships. Leave room for worship. Leave room for beauty. Take time aside maybe to just forget all the problems. Read a poem. Look at a painting, listen to music, play a game, do something that uh, brings enjoyment. Watch a football match, if you must, in order to, to give pleasure and appreciate what life is about. I'm not arguing against any of the practical stuff. We definitely need to do that. There are poor people that need to be taken care of. There is a uh, war that needs to be fought against. And, and peace that needs to be resolved, that there are all kinds of things that we need to do in the world, in the church, in our personal lives. But let's take some time to be human and to appreciate all that Jesus Christ has done for us. I want to end with worship and I'm going to finish in just a moment with a blessing. But after that, um, I'm going to use... Uh, the help of Frederick Chopin and Salvador Dali, just to give you an opportunity for a little worship. And if those two people don't help you out at all, well, stop the video and worship in your own way. But for now, may the blessing of God, Father and Son and Holy Spirit, rest upon you and remain with you evermore. Amen. <laughs>